The Focused Ultrasound Foundation is proud to host a webinar in recognition of Breast Cancer Awareness Month entitled Focused Ultrasound and Breast Cancer, Current Treatments for Active Disease and Potential Applications During Survivorship. In 2023, the statistics for breast cancer from the American Cancer Society are still sobering and include the following. In the United States, about 298,000 women and 2,800 men will receive a new diagnosis of invasive breast cancer each year. Another fact, about 44,000 women in the US will die from breast cancer this year and a total of 685,000 deaths are expected worldwide. Due to a variety of socioeconomic factors as well as race and ethnicity, we should acknowledge that there is a disparity in these statistics. For example, black women have the highest death rate from breast cancer and they also have a higher chance of developing breast cancer before the age of 40. Currently, there are 4 million breast cancer survivors in the US and thus addressing the needs of patients currently in treatment, as well as those who have completed treatment is the focus of today's webinar. I am Suzanne LeBlanc, a radiologist and the director of clinical relationships at the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. I am also a breast cancer survivor. Having endured treatments with surgery, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, this topic is quite personal and powerful for me. I look forward to assisting in the process of incorporating Focus Ultrasound into the treatment toolbox for patients with breast cancer, hoping to improve outcomes and minimize side effects. Now, before we get started, a few technical items. If your connection is lost, please simply log in again using your registration link. Following the presentations, all of the panelists will join for a live moderated question and answer session. So please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer as many as possible. After today, if you would like to listen to parts of this webinar again or share it with coworkers, friends, or family, you will receive a link to the event or you can find it on our YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Now, please allow me to briefly summarize the agenda for the next hour. I'm honored to introduce the following esteemed speakers. We will first hear from Dr. Natasha Shebani, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Research Director at the UVA Focused Ultrasound Cancer Immunotherapy Center. She has been instrumental in researching various focused ultrasound applications in preclinical breast cancer animal models. Immediately following her presentation, we will hear from Dr. David Brennan, Chief of the Division of Breast and Melanoma Surgical Services at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. He has been a leader in clinical focused ultrasound breast cancer research and works closely with Dr. Shebani to start first in human clinical trials. Then we have a very special guest. We are incredibly appreciative that Christina, a breast cancer patient under the care of Dr. Brennan, and who is also currently enrolled in an ongoing focused ultrasound clinical trial, will share her journey. I have had the fortune of speaking with her before this webinar, and I'm sure you will agree that she is an incredibly strong woman and will be engaged by her transparency and words of wisdom. And now on to our speakers. Hello, everyone. My name is Natasha Shebani. I'm an assistant professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia. Uh, I also serve as the research director for our focused ultrasound cancer immunotherapy center. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to be speaking with you all about focused ultrasound immuno oncology advances for breast cancer. Starting with a reminder of some of the tremendous benefits of focused ultrasound technology, it is a non-invasive intervention uh, as well as non-ionizing, uh, and it's also been shown to be safe, repeatable in, in circumstances that necessitate a repeat drug delivery, for instance. And finally, it is a highly precise um, energy uh, deposition that we are able to achieve on the order of submillimeter precision. And for this reason, the bioeffects of focused ultrasound are highly um, targeted and, and highly localized. Now, uh, these bioeffects that I'm alluding to fall on a, on a pretty broad spectrum ranging from thermal to mechanical in nature, but what they really ought to impress upon this audience is that Focused ultrasound is a highly tunable technology. In fact, the mechanisms of action are highly versatile and, and uh, broad in scope that is well beyond what I'm able to cover in the brief time we have today. However, I will say uniformly across the bioeffects that we're very interested in interrogating are uh, a few themes that are resonant within our lab as well as our center at UVA. 
Um, when we think about this this lens uh, of thermal or or mechanical intervention, we can immediately think about ways that we can damage and or destroy tumor tissue. Um, that damage or destruction can in turn lead to very interesting ways that the immune system might be stimulated or effectively modulated uh, to mobilize against cancer. That is another element that we study. And finally, there are ways that we can tune these sound waves with the, the explicit goal of uh, improving or potentiating um, immunotherapy delivery. And so I'm going to be touching on all these themes very briefly today. Before doing that, I want to just highlight what uh, positions UVA rather uniquely to be focusing on these subjects. Um, our Focused Ultrasound Cancer Immunotherapy Center was basically the world's first uh, center of its kind, and it was established with a, the intent mission of discovery at the, beds, at the bench side, translating those discoveries to the bench side, and uh, in turn, taking what we then learn at the bedside and bringing it back to the bench. So this is underscored by the term reverse translation here, which is a very important pillar of translation that we uh, often overlook. And taken together, all of these um, abilities that we have within the scope of our center uh, hopefully position us to differentiate UVA as um, a leading institution in the advancement of focused ultrasound and cancer immunotherapy, uh, as well as uh, as a, um, a place that is catalyzing um, the uh, adoption of these um, approaches at the clinical level. There are many areas that we are emphasizing as far as thematic integration goes. Uh, so there are specific cancers that we are very interested in, in performing this exercise of, of discovery and translation within. A few of them are listed here. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus our discussion on breast cancer. And I felt it best to uh, describe some of our work in breast cancer through the lens of one specific exemplar uh, of bench-to-bedside translation. And so for the purpose of that vignette, I'm going to talk about thermal fuss. This is basically a principle whereby we are able to deploy those focused sound waves in a manner that achieves um, highly localized uh, burning of tissue or thermal destruction of tissue. And this is specifically in a, in a highly aggressive, spontaneously metastatic model of triple negative breast cancer uh, in mice, known as 4T1. So this is a very nice preclinical model for us to study uh, one of the most uh, aggressive and incurable forms of breast cancer. And you can actually see a representative example of one of these 4T1 tumors here on the left where we basically have overlaid a grid of sonications here denoted in, by the red points. And what you'll see when I play the video is effectively where we are um, moving to each point uh, using a three-dimensional uh, uh, um, motion uh, system. And we're basically able to ablate at each point and visualize that process in real time. Now, what we see on histology by virtue of this ablation uh, is a pattern that looks something like this on H&E staining. What I want to uh, impress upon those looking at this um, uh, image and detecting regions of viable tissue is that we're actually being very intentional here about performing what we call a subtotal or partial ablation. You can see from the pattern of these red sonication points that we are intentionally performing a sparse grid-like pattern or, or uh, overlaying a sparse grid-like pattern on these tumors uh, with the intent to cause localized destruction of tumor tissue, but to also leave behind some substrate that is either immunogenically damaged or otherwise viable in a manner that might serve as a meaningful stimulus for the immune system to respond locally to the damage that we've exerted. And so this was sort of the principle on which we began to build now years ago, a paradigm thinking about ways that we are modulating the immune system and or creating a situation for synergy with um, key immunoadjuvants. And I'm basically going to highlight a, a couple of important things that really um, served as a prelude for us as to how uh, immunologically cold or recalcitrant this tumor model is. 
Uh, what you're seeing on the left is the results of applying thermally ablative fuss in these tumors, where you can see we really don't get uh, much of any benefit. And this parallels what we often see in this model with uh, immunotherapy, such as our classical checkpoint inhibitors, uh, like PD-1 blockade. You can see that in monotherapy format, we really don't um, see any benefit of checkpoint inhibition. And this is um, pretty standard uh, within the literature. But of course, a, a great preface for why we need to think about ways to better sensitize these breast tumors to the effects of immunotherapy. And so with that background in mind, one of the first things that we had to grapple with as a team was where the barriers might exist to achieving immune-mediated control of metastatic breast cancer in this setting. And um, as it turns out, uh, for at, at risk of um, overlooking a lot of years of, of sort of looking under the hood of these tumors, I will just summarize to say that uh, we performed a number of immune characterization assays that basically landed us on a highly immunosuppressive cell population known as the myeloid-derived suppressor cells. As their name uh, eponymously suggests, they are basically there to suppress um, tamp down uh, immune responses that would typically be um, uh, exerted by our T cells. So in this case, for in very simple terms, I'm framing our T cells as the good guys. We want more of those within the tumor. And unfortunately, our blue population near the MDSCs are the bad guys, which are basically curbing what would be an effective immunological response against the tumor. As it turns out, there's a very um, um, favorable chemotherapy known as gemcitabine, which has a nice safety profile in patients. It's very, very well tolerated. It is also used in the palliative setting in breast cancer. So it was a natural um, immune adjuvant for us to gravitate to specifically for the purposes of achieving myeloreduction or transient inhibition of that myeloid population. Our hypothesis was that in achieving that, we might be able to sensitize these breast tumors to a, a more favorable um, a driving of T-cell responses via FUS, but also create a more sensitive background on which to begin layering other immunotherapies. And to summarize, we did indeed do this. We brought together the combination of thermal FUS and gemcitabine and observed reduced tumor burden. We also observed extended overall survival of mice. And we were even able to implicate the specific role of the adaptive immune system in this context, as well as um, our uh, T cells as being uh, responsible for the protective effects of thermal FUS and gemcitabine. Um, this work was published in the Journal for Immunotherapy of Cancer back in 2020. So what I will simply uh, close this vignette with is uh, perhaps the most uh, exciting uh, result here, which is that we have now been able to take these findings at the bench side and actually translate them into a clinical trial that is now ongoing here at UVA. This is the BR54 trial, which is deploying this ultrasound-guided focused ultrasound system you're seeing here, the Thoracleon Echo Pulse, for the purposes of thermally ablating early stage breast tumors and um, interrogating combination of that approach with low-dose gemcitabine. So Dr. Brennan, uh, who will be speaking momentarily, will um, introduce the BR54 trial in, in more detail and also describe further how this relates to other ongoing trials at UVA. So from the perspective of our lab, I just wanted to close by sort of asking a more provocative question about what's next. Uh, we're thinking about a lot of other themes within this same context of immunotherapy and focused ultrasound. And I'll just introduce one by first showing some preliminary data um, from the same data set that I showed you previously that we published in Jitsi. We also determined that about seven days after focused ultrasound, there seems to be this significant increase in the absolute number as well as the maturity of dendritic cells within the axillary draining lymph nodes of mice that had undergone just uh, partial thermal ablation with focused ultrasounds. This was a really fascinating outcome to us in part because it suggested to us that some insult that we were administering to the local tumor microenvironment was bearing impact on the composition and frequency of cells within the systemic setting, specifically within the draining lymph nodes. 
And of course, seeing as dendritic cells are the professional antigen presenting cells, they are really an important link between the innate and adaptive immune responses. It was critically important to us to then think about ways that we could potentially leverage this further toward um, exerting uh, robust immune responses against the breast tumors. And to this end, we are currently exploring ways to do that through use of immune adjuvants such as anti-CD40. As denoted in the schematic here, this is an agonistic antibody that is basically interfacing with not only dendritic cells, but also macrophages and B cells, and collectively um, providing the right type of stimulus within that innate and adapt to, uh, adaptive immune axis in order to promote the anti-tumor effects and overall um, anti-tumor cytotoxicity of CDA-positive T cells. So we have already begun to appreciate uh, uh, some cooperation between thermal FOS and anti-CD40, and I'm just showcasing, showcasing that here in some unpublished data that we are now probing uh, at a much deeper level within a few different uh, breast tumor um, settings that include not only triple negative, but other subtypes as well. We're also exploring other focused ultrasound regimens, so we are not necessarily limited to thermal ablation. There are also modes by which we can exert uh, mechanically ablative uh, stimuli within the tumor, and that's exemplified here by uh, an application of boiling histotripsy, where we are basically now applying high-intensity pulsed sound waves in an effort to mechanically fractionate breast tumor tissue. And indeed, in a triple negative breast cancer model, what I'm showing you here is histology uh, for sham tumors as well as frustrated tumors where you can appreciate that the degree of damage is much greater uh, in the fuss condition by way of h &E. We can see that we're causing a tremendous degree of liquefaction within the tumor where we targeted. And this is corroborated by positive PARP1 staining, which basically denotes DNA damage and signaling along the apoptotic pathway. Finally, we are also uh, placing a lens on other types of immunotherapies, not just antibodies, but also engineered T cells, more specifically chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cells. These uh, come with their own various challenges when it comes to deployment of CAR T cells in solid tumors, and some of those are listed here. Um, in the interest of time, I won't necessarily step through these challenges, but simply say that there are a variety of creative ways that we can envision overcoming uh, these challenges with focused ultrasound. Is that, and that is something that our, our lab, as well as many others in the field, are uh, fervently working on at the moment. Finally, I will just say that um, we are not only uh, keen on thinking about ways to combat breast cancer at the primary disease site, but also at the site of distal or metastatic disease. And specifically, I'm showing you here an example of where we've deployed a model of breast cancer brain metastasis with the intent of understanding how we can intervene on disease once it has reached the brain. Uh, we can do a variety of different things, but the example shown here is of MRI-guided intervention, uh, focused ultrasound intervention on these brain tumors by way of blood-brain barrier disruption, where you can appreciate that the enhancement we see here at baseline is um, significantly increased in both volume and intensity after we disrupt the blood-brain barrier transiently. And this can give way to a variety of other investigations we can perform on the um, immunotherapy delivery front, as well as uh, with immunomodulation. We're also leveraging other sophisticated tools in molecular imaging to contextualize where our drugs go by basically labeling them, specifically radio labeling them, and spatiotemporally tracking their distribution within the body. And there's just an example here again of a pre and post bus image, uh, PET image, in, in what is not a, a breast tumor, but a brain tumor that is basically meant to, to show the proof of concept here. And finally, uh, in, in our efforts to leverage advanced imaging, uh, as well as other tools like liquid biopsy, more specifically blood draws, I will just say that we are very rapidly uh, reaching the point where we can envision non-invasive longitudinal surveillance as being um, a regular um, uh, means for us to really monitor our combinatorial paradigms and eventually improve them. 
with the amassing of more data from these readouts, we can envision performing a biomarker discovery and, and utilizing tools that would enable pattern recognition toward that explicit goal. And so this brings me to a major goal of our lab and summary, which is to basically uh, envision a future where we can achieve completely non-invasive risk stratification treatment and surveillance in not only breast cancer, but other tumor types as well. And our hope is very much that this goal is is with an eye toward preserving um, not only the um, safety of patients, but their comfort throughout the cancer care. And of course, this is in line with our efforts to improve the overall efficacy of cancer care. So with that, I'm very much looking forward to further discussion about the topic of focused ultrasound in breast cancer. I'd like to thank our research and clinical collaborators our current funding sources, and the foundation for the kind invitation to participate in this webinar. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. David Brennan, and today I will be discussing focused ultrasound immuno-oncology clinical trials at the University of Virginia. Our approach of using focused ultrasound ablation to treat tumors in the breast has been to start with benign tumors, and once we demonstrated safety there, move to treating patients with advanced or stage four breast cancer, and then once proving safety and efficacy in treating those patients, moving on to early stage breast cancer. So how is the procedure carried out? The patient is first positioned comfortably on a stretcher and intravenous conscious sedation is provided throughout the procedure as needed. The mass is then localized with standard ultrasound imaging and degassed local anesthetic is injected around the tumor. The transducer head is then positioned over the lesion to allow for optimal imaging of the mass, and targeting and treatment planning is performed in multiple planes throughout the lesion. During the procedure, there are alternating ablation and cooling cycles. Each sonication pulse lasts several seconds, followed by an adequate cooling time, which typically varies between 10 and 25 seconds. The pulse power is first adjusted to create boiling within the tissue, in the sonication zone, and then once we determine the adequate pulse power, the treatment progresses until all the sonication sites in the treatment plan have been delivered. So what does it look like? This is the lesion before treatment as seen on ultrasound. A sonication pulse is then delivered, and this results in a hypoechoic mark as depicted here following the sonication. The treatment head then moves to the next sonication site, and another pulse is given. This heats up the second area in the treatment plan. The device then moves to the third area in the treatment plan. Another sonication pulse is given. And this continues till all of the sites in the treatment plan are sonicated. Following treatment, the lesion usually looks like this. So this is typically what we saw. These are images from our first patient. On the left, uh, you have the pre-treatment ultrasound image with the volume for the fibroadenoma being 1.53 cubic centimeters. Three months later, after treatment, the volume was down to 0.47 cubic centimeters. That's a 69% reduction in volume. And as it turns out, that was typical for the 20 patients that we treated. As you can see here, there was a mean percent reduction in volume at 12 months for the 20 patients in that trial of 68.9%. Okay, so we had some good experience treating benign tumors of the breast. Now it's time to move forward with treating breast cancers at UVA. So I wanted to leverage everything we had going for us at UVA, namely that we have a fantastic multidisciplinary breast cancer program. We have an internationally prominent human immune therapy center headed up by Dr. Craig Slingloff, and we have our clinical focused ultrasound devices. I wanted to leverage all of this, so we decided we were going to move forward by treating breast cancer with a combination of focused ultrasound ablation and immune therapy at our program. Immune therapy has been a real game changer lately and has been very effective to treat patients who have highly immunogenic tumors such as melanoma lung cancer, and kidney cancer, but has only shown minimal results for tumors that are not very immunogenic, like breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, and colon and rectal tumors. We hope that we can treat minimally immunogenic tumors with focused ultrasound ablation and make them more immunogenic. 
minimally immunogenic cancers like breast cancer use lots of tricks to evade the immune system, including secreting type 1 interferon, which generally tamps down all immune responses. These tumors can also recruit myeloid-derived suppressor cells and T regulatory cells, which tend to tamp down the immune response locally at the tumor site itself. And these tumors can express programmed cell death ligand 1 or PDL1, which downregulates CD8 positive T cells' ability to kill the tumor. Here's a cartoon showing a very tricky breast cancer cell. And unfortunately, this is commonly the case. That breast cancer cell is here, and it not only has an antigen for tumor cell on its surface, but it also makes that antigen PDL1. Remember, PDL1 convinces attacking tumor infiltrating lymphocyte sites, as depicted here, that the tumor isn't a tumor at all, but that it's normal tissue. It's telling this T cell, well, you may have gotten here, you may have detected that something's wrong, but there's really nothing wrong. Just move along. Leave me alone. The way anti PDL drugs work is that it blocks that PDL1 tumor, not allowing it to tell the T cell to leave it alone, resulting in the T cell killing the cancer. For our first study of focused ultrasound ablation to treat breast cancer at the University of Virginia, we combined focused ultrasound ablation with a drug called pembrolizumab. Pembrolizumab is a programmed cell death 1 inhibitor and has been shown to be effective against treatment of some triple negative breast cancers, which tend to be more immunogenic. But pembrolizumab is not effective against estroreceptor positive tumors, which tend to fly under the radar of the patient's immune system. That brings us to our first study at the University of Virginia to treat breast cancer with focused ultrasound ablation, namely breast 48, which utilized focused ultrasound ablation plus the drug I just mentioned, pembrolizumab, to treat patients with stage 4 breast cancer. The idea behind this is, is that we know that focused ultrasound ablation can cause an acute thermal injury to the tumor and initiate a brisk local immune response. As part of that immune response, CDA-positive T cells would then traffic to and infiltrate into the damaged area of the tumor, and then we could give pembrolizumab, which could upregulate that local cellular immune response, hopefully resulting in a brisk systemic response as well. This is the schema for that trial, breast 48. In the first arm or arm A, patients got pembrolizumab after the focused ultrasound ablation, and in arm B, patients got the pembrolizumab prior to focused ultrasound ablation. Here are ultrasound images from one of the first breast cancers that we treated. Here's the tumor within the breast. Here's a clip as seen on ultrasound within the cancer. Here is an image from the treatment plan. And as you can see, we delivered focused ultrasound ablation pulses to only within the tumor. We did not treat any of the surrounding tissue. 22 days after the ablation, we biopsied tissue in the periablation zone and tissue from within the ablated region of the tumor. This very busy slide shows a series of photomicrographs. Uh, in this column, uh, this is before treatment within the tumor. This is at day 22 in the area of the tumor that we ablated. And this is at day 22 in the periablative zone. In this case, still within the tumor itself. They show an increase in the number of CD8 positive T cells that infiltrated into the tumor as compared to pretreatment, as well as an upregulation of PDL1 within the tumor, again as compared to pretreatment. REST48 is now completed and closed to accrual, and the final data from that study is currently being analyzed. However, the preliminary data was intriguing. And we've now come to the point where it's time to open a study looking at focused ultrasound ablation to treat patients with early stage breast cancer. That brings us to breast 54. The use of focused ultrasound ablation in combination with gemcitabine to treat patients with early stage breast cancer. This study is currently open and accruing at the University of Virginia. The study has three arms. In arm A, patients received gemcitabine only followed by standard treatment. In arm B, 
Patients receive focused ultrasound ablation only, followed by standard treatment. And in RMC, the patients receive a combination of both gemcitabine and focused ultrasound ablation, followed by standard treatment. Patients would be followed for five years, and tissue will be collected both before and after treatments. So why gemcitabine? Well, it has been demonstrated in preclinical trials in the Price Lab at UVA using mouse models that gemcitabine can decrease circulating myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Myeloid-derived suppressor cells traffic to an immune response and tamp it down. It is our hypothesis if we can decrease the circulating myeloid-derived suppressor cells available to traffic to a tumor that, when we apply focused ultrasound ablation, there should be an increased immune response. This is the surgical specimen from the, one of the first patients we treated on breast 54. You can see this necrotic area where focused ultrasound ablation was performed adjacent to normal, viable breast tissue. Again, this is our intent. We intend to only treat part of the tumor so that viable tumor remains to biopsy where we believe the immune response will occur. This is a photomicrograph taken from that same specimen. It demonstrates viable tumor cells adjacent to necrotic cells from focused ultrasound ablation. Breast 54 is currently open to accrual and seven patients have been enrolled and treated to date. We are now using the updated Theraclion device, which allows us to treat patients with much smaller tumors. We strongly believe that focused ultrasound ablation has the potential to be both a local and systemic therapy, and we will be leveraging that concept in current trials at the University of Virginia, which use focused ultrasound ablation in combination with immune therapy for patients who otherwise would have a very low likelihood of response to immune therapy alone. Finally, I'd like to thank the following organizations and individuals without whom we couldn't make this happen. Thank you for your attention. We're very fortunate that we have Christina here to share her experience with ongoing breast cancer treatment and the fact that she is a participant in one of the focused ultrasound studies. Now, Christina is 39 years old. Um, she has a five-year-old son at home named Jackson and she is currently battling uh, against breast cancer. In 2022, she was diagnosed. She had a mastectomy. Uh, she just finished her chemotherapy and about to start her radiation therapy. So we're so fortunate that she's here to share her journey. So hi, Christina. Uh, thank you for being here. Hi. And tell me about your journey through this surgery and the chemotherapy so far. How are you doing? We're doing really well. I'm grateful that um, it hasn't been you know, incredibly difficult it's come with its, its set of challenges, but uh, again, I'm, just, I'm I'm grateful that I was able to you know continue to work and parents, and uh, you know I was even able to. You know, fortunately, I was, was hoping to, and I was able to go turkey hunting in the spring. You know, right after you know a couple weeks after surgery. So uh, I'm, just, I'm grateful that uh, it hasn't been terribly challenging. You know, and I've been able to maintain. Um, my, you know, quality of life with my family. Oh, that's awesome. And, you know, when we were talking before, you used some really powerful phrases with me. You said that you wouldn't let your disease define you and it wasn't your identity. Um, can you just share with us some of the um, feelings that you had and some of the side effects that you have had during your chemotherapy thus far? Sure. Yeah, I, I did it, you know, it, it was something that I... Um, and I wasn't overly vocal. I didn't share a lot of what was going on with me, social media, et cetera, because it was something I wanted to navigate with my close family and friends independently without it becoming, you know, my, my identity. In fact, you know, most people I, I work with still don't even know. Um, but I, of course, lost my hair, so I ended up finding a, a really nice, very realistic wig, so that's good. And yeah, pretty good at drawing my eyebrows on. Eyelashes, I think I miss the most. From that perspective, you don't realize how much stuff gets in your eyes uh, when you don't have anything keeping it out. But the chemotherapy, uh, the challenges that I experienced with a ton of bone pain, and small bones, cheekbones, ribs, things like that. I would take Claritin to 
do my best at preventing that, but the, the new lasso, once that would be released the day after, which is was very convenient to be able to have it so I didn't have to go back in, but the, the bone pain, the fatigue, the headaches, just the overwhelming exhaustion. I was fortunate not to have a, a lot of nausea really much at all, and I was able to eat and maintain my weight, but the exhaustion and, you know, the inability to be as active as I was, you know, accustomed to being was, was hard, but I'm, I'm grateful because I, I recognize that so many other people have such extreme difficulties with the chemotherapy regimen that I was on. So I don't, I don't want to whine a lot about it, but I do, it was, uh, it definitely took a lot of perseverance, particularly during the, the AC part of the ACT. That was just brutal in comparison to the tax hall. Thank you for sharing that about the chemotherapy. And I'm so glad you're done with your therapy. And hopefully every day you'll feel better and better. So at a time when they offer you the treatment for your stage of disease and you're excited to start the treatment because you want to get rid of the cancer, how did they offer you possible entry into the clinical trial with focused ultrasound, and what was your deciding factor to finally enter it? Um, so they explained the trial with, um, you know, the low dose chemo and then the um, ablation ultrasound. And um, you know, I for me, it wasn't it wasn't going when when I thought about you know what was being presented in front of me. It was you know the timeline for for my treatment was not going to change. There was no interruption. There was no, there was no reason not to participate in my mind because it was something that if the information that would be gained out of the research, you know, it could be helpful to, to someone else going through what I had just, you know, started on. And there was no, there was no addition to the timeline. There was there was nothing that I could see that was going to be painful or create a disruption in, in getting you know to the next step. So you know for that you know, it seemed like a like a no brainer. But when you think about, especially you know you hear from some people, you know you're too young for this. Or at this age, I can't believe this happens. And then you talk to you know someone else who sees this every day, and they're like, no, this is this is happening a lot to to women that are younger. It doesn't wait for a certain age. Uh, cancer cancer doesn't have a, a mind to wait for for an age and when it's appropriate. So I because uh, it never would be appropriate. I I wanted to be a part of helping somebody else down the road with their decisions, with their timeline, um, making it easier because it's, you know, it's, it's unfair, but you know, what's the saying? I think there's a line in the princess bride that says, uh, life isn't fair. Anybody who tells you different trying to sell you something. So for me, it just seemed like a no brainer to help, um, other people if I had the opportunity to and do it with a you know, little pain and little disruption, right? Also, as a breast cancer survivor, I'm very appreciative that you took part in, in this trial and your courage and your determination is just amazing. And I hope for, for both of us, as well as the breast cancer patients that are currently undergoing treatment and those that are going to get diagnosed in the future, the hope is that focused ultrasound can offer another treatment alternative um, for early stage and late stage patients and possibly decrease the side effects from the chemotherapy. Um, especially as you being so young, right? There are other issues to consider, such as future fertility. So we're going to do everything in our power with focused ultrasound to try to improve the outcomes and decrease the side effects for you and for others to come. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope that we can keep in touch. Thanks so much. And thank you for offering me a, a chance to, to say, you know, speak my voice and to, to share, you know, my journey because I think it's really important for you know women to continue to be a part of the journey for generations to come as this is something that's that's happening that's when it's going to happen to somebody that you can be part of making that just a little bit better because it it, it really is a shocking and just challenging mentally emotionally and physically to go through and so if you can make that a little bit better for somebody else and 
also feel better about it while you're going through it. So that was, you know, part of what this trial also gave me was, was purpose, purpose through pain. And that is a huge mental gift. So thank you for selecting me and you know, allowing me the time to, to speak my piece here because I think it's, it's really valuable and it's helpful for me to, to help move on. Well, thank you so much for your time, your concern, your passion. And again, we will keep in touch. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Wow. Wow. I want to thank Christina again for sharing her journey and her reasons for participating in the Focused Ultrasound Clinical Trial. Her, her words are so powerful and her actions will hopefully improve the care of many patients moving forwards. Um, and now on to the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, let's see. We'll have some coming in. Um, but right now, we can all appreciate how efforts with FUS can lead to improved outcomes, thanks to the research of Dr. Shabani and Dr. Brennan. But patients are still suffering from these side effects. So Dr. Brennan, perhaps you can share with us your experience in treating these patients. Uh, what are the other side effects from chemo and radiation? How are they treated or some permanent? Uh, how do you address these issues? Well, you, you heard from the experience from Christina and uh, <clears throat> Um, you know, there are many side effects. The most common ones are fatigue uh, and um, uh, direct effects from the chemotherapy, but often there are some delayed effects, especially to one of the drugs uh, that uh, Christina had mentioned, uh, Taxotere. Uh, this drug can cause uh, neuropathy that uh, can result in numbness and sometimes pain. Uh, you know, in the future, it's possible that focused ultrasound may also uh, be uh, effective at treating neuropathy. There are ongoing studies now, both uh, in animal models and some observations uh, treating other neurologic problems in people that could result in non-invasive treatments uh, to help relieve pain and other symptoms caused by chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. So that's one of the hopes for the future uh, and a possible role that focused ultrasound might play uh, in controlling um, side effects in survivorship. Yeah, you know, I know when I was going through the treatment, uh, the neuropathy was actually my most feared potential complication, the neuropathy in the fingers, because I'm a piano player and I like to play pickleball and I wanted to preserve the sensation and uh, not have pain in my hands. So I know that was a big fear of mine. Um, as you said, you know, there is focused ultrasound research in using neuromodulation to try to either stimulate nerves or suppress nerves. And there's been an abundance of preclinical work and some very early clinical work in humans where they were able to actually suppress some induced pain in the median nerve. Um, so I think that's really exciting and could potentially really help you know, a lot of patients that develop this complication from the neuropathy. It's you certainly know, a, an, a good avenue for research moving forward. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but we'll need to test this with clinical trials like uh, everything else that we do for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we need to start somewhere. And, uh, you know, it's great to hear from Christina about, uh, you know, her experience in participating in a clinical trial, which I'd say is uh, accurate. For most of our patients who participate in these trials, uh, you know, I'm currently putting together a lecture uh, for later this month. Obviously, it's October. We're doing a lot of things, and I'm looking back at some of the trials that were done in the early '70s, uh, just uh, and uh, how that has had a tremendous impact on how we treat patients today. And it's my hope that the studies that we're doing currently will have a similar impact, um, including those done with focused ultrasound ablation. Yeah, I mean, there's clearly a lot to research. And Dr. Shabani, we have a lot of work for you to do in the lab with combinations of focused ultrasound with immunotherapies and chemotherapies, possibly, um, you know, focused ultrasound is that powerful uh, in helping to generate an immune response. Perhaps we can decrease the dose of chemotherapies and or radiation therapies, but your research is so important. So, you know, my question to you is, how long does it typically take to develop a hypothesis tested in animals and analyze the data to see if it's worthwhile to get into a clinical trial? What are the barriers uh, in expediting this research? Because we need you to do it quickly. 
<laughs> you know, I, I uh, we have no shortage of hypotheses. Let me start there. So if I were to turn off my uh, my background right now, you'd be privy to multiple whiteboards and an ocean of sticky notes on my desk that are full of project ideas and hypotheses. And I draw a tremendous amount of inspiration from stories like Christina's and, and from our breast cancer patients, because I really do believe that there's a lot we can be doing at the bench side that is deeply informed by the patient experience. And that harkens back to your point about um, things like the, the long-term effects of chemotherapy. And, and at our disposal, we, we have here a tool that we um, posit can, can influence um, the targeted delivery of therapies, if not enable us to reduce, reduce the dose of, of therapy necessary to um, to whether it's engage the immune system or just uh, kill cancer. So at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I draw a lot of inspiration from that, from the perspective of hypothesis development. I think that looking to the patient experience and to what we would want to envision for focused ultrasound and clinical trials really does influence what can and should happen at the bench side. Mm -hmm. However, to your point about how preclinical studies take place, the reality is that there is a lot of time that goes into science and there's a lot of um, you know, um, personnel uh, bandwidth limitation that comes with how quickly we can, we can answer questions on occasion. So to give you some perspective, Oh, let's see. Oh, we lost in. her. Oh, just when we were getting to the punchline. <laughs> <laughs> so I okay. see that there's a couple of questions on the Q&A there, uh, yep. Susie. Yep. Um, let's see. How about, can you explain in detail about MR-guided focused ultrasound? Is there any studies about the effect of MRI with fuss on cancer tissue destruction? Sure. I can handle that. Sure. sure. Uh, so uh, many of the people in the audience have probably had an MRI of some sort or another. And as you recall, you went to a big building and you went to a big room in that big building and you got into a big machine and they took hopefully all of your metallic containing devices away from you, including your cell phone uh, and did the MRI. Uh, so when we use, when we do focused ultrasound ablation, we need to guide it. We need to see what we're treating, right? So that's really, when we say MRI guided, that, that's really what that means. We're using an MRI machine uh, to uh, identify and localize the, the tumor if, if when we're treating cancer that we're treating, uh, and also to visualize the focused ultrasound ablation lesion. And with MRI, we're also able to more directly measure the temperature of the tissue uh, that we're reaching. So, but the problem is it takes a literally a whole building to do that. Uh, if we compare that to ultrasound guided uh, focused ultrasound ablation, uh, Natasha, Dr. Shabani showed you a picture of the device that we're using, the, um, the Insight Tech device. That's about the size of a dishwasher, uh, and that's ultrasound guided focused ultrasound ablation. So it's really much easier to use, uh, probably will have uh, uh, much easier to deploy in the field in multiple sites, uh, and is more than adequate to visualize most tumors in the breast. So that's really the main difference between MR-guided focused ultrasound ablation and ultrasound-guided focused ultrasound ablation. Obviously, depending on the indication, if you're treating in the brain MRI, uh, you might need that level of precision. Uh, but in the breast, ultrasound guidance is more than adequate and way more convenient and easy to use. Thank you for explaining that difference. Appreciate it. We have Dr. Shabani back. And Dr. Shabani, I, I don't know if you did that on purpose to have us waiting with bated breath so we can hear <laughs> what you have to say about your example of uh, research. No, but I think I got too passionate and the UVA network was like the hook that pulled me <laughs> off the stage. <laughs> Just to, to, to finish my, my comment, you know, my, my point was that um, scientific discovery comes with triumphs and failures. You know, we, we do have, um, uh, you know, uh, failures, for lack of a better term, that we have to grapple with in the lab. And so that, too, adds time. So all of that, to, to culminate with an answer to your question, is to say that our real barriers uh, are time, which we don't have control over, but also um, funding and resources to continue pushing the work ahead. We're very grateful to the Focused Ultrasound Foundation uh, for infusing so many resources. And, and so much support into this work. And finally, people. Uh, I think that the more we spread the word about the excitement
excitement surrounding this technology and, and enable people to share in the mission of clinical translation and, and impact to patients, then hopefully there will be others that share my own and Dr. Brennan's enthusiasm about engaging with this work. And we could use that support on both the discovery and translation side. So, so we could always use um, more hands as well. Okay, well, I'm sure this webinar will help spread the word and we'll get more people in there to help you. Um, we have another question for Dr. Brennan. Um, it says you're finding differences in your recruitment rate. Are you finding differences in your recruitment rates with the advanced stage and early stage trials? Do you anticipate any difficulties in getting patients with early stage disease to enroll in these trials? Um, well, it's always something that's on our minds when we design clinical trials, mm -hmm. uh, and it's always a concern. Uh, but uh, usually it's not that um, big a problem. Uh, especially if we design the trials so they don't really interfere with standard treatment and they don't delay treatment in any significant way. Uh, so uh, one of the big barriers that we had initially in treating in our early stage trial, which is ongoing now compared to our stage four trial, was that uh, the device that we had at the time that we started doing focused ultrasound ablation in the breast UVA uh, really had older ultrasound imaging technology, so we can only see very large tumors. Uh, luckily, a few months ago, uh, we received an updated device uh, with the help of the foundation to purchase that device. Uh, and that has allowed us to really move into kind of the standard uh, um, level of precision and quality uh, of ultrasound imaging in the breast that's available today that a patient might uh, have available uh, when they go for breast imaging. And that's allowed us uh, to treat tumors that are much smaller. So it's really opened up, a, uh, you know, probably 80% more of the patients who have early stage breast cancers to being eligible to uh, participate in these trials. Um, so there are pros and cons between, you know, the late stage trials and the early stage trials, but there are way more patients who have early stage breast cancer, uh, luckily, than have late stage breast cancer because we successfully treat these patients with early stage breast cancer. Um, so when we bring up the trial, it's uh, not unusual that patients are interested. I saw eight cancers this week, two patients wanted to participate in the trial. One is uh, seeing someone today, uh, Dr. Dillon today, hopefully, and will enroll. Unfortunately, the other one's tumor was just slightly too deep, so she couldn't participate in the trial. Um, so the short answer to your question is, it's always difficult to accrue patients into clinical trials, uh, but if we design them well, uh, it's less of an issue. Okay, and can you just clarify for our viewers whether this technology is available in the clinic now or it's only in clinical trials right now in the United States? Well, in the United States, it's only available in clinical trials. Um, there really are no ablative therapies that are approved for breast cancer treatment mm -hmm. in the United States. All are in clinical trials at this point in the U.S. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, when we talk about survivorship and continued pain, you know, a lot of patients develop bone metastases and have pain from bone mets and may need radiation therapy or high doses of medications to subvert the pain. Um, Dr. Brennan, what's your feeling about um, treating these patients yeah. and the opportunity of focused ultrasound to help in these cases? Well, focused ultrasound ablation has been investigated and I believe has an FDA approval uh, mm -hmm. in the US to treat bone metastasis. Uh, and it's very effective at, um, at uh, de-innervating the, the area of the metastasis and that, and that way uh, it's, it, very effectively treats that pain. And one of the advantages of it is compared to radiation therapy is that you can retreat these areas because uh, you haven't radiated them. When you radiate an area, you really reach a maximal dose often given at the time of the initial therapy. Uh, but with, with focused ultrasound ablation, you can treat an area, render the patient pain-free hopefully. And then if her disease or their disease progresses, uh, you can retreat uh, and hopefully gain similar uh, results in treating that area and rendering the patient pain-free. Right, so that could really be, focused ultrasound can be used to help the pain from bone metastases without having to go under more radiation. Correct, you know, and, and the side effects will be less as well. Radiation carries 
uh, fatigue as the main side effect mm -hmm. uh, and the focused ultrasound ablation really does not. Yep, yep. And, you know, Natasha, we're talking about radiation therapy now, uh, part of the treatment um, of, of treating the actual breast cancer itself sometimes involves radiation therapy. And, you know, do you have any interest or, or can you tell us a little bit about how focused ultrasound can maybe enhance radiation sensitization of the primary tumor or any research that may be going on in that area in hopes of how focused ultrasound can help maybe decrease the radiation dose? Absolutely. And then what I will say is, is true to, you know, when you look at the mainstays of cancer therapy, I, I think I've said this before, there are ways that we can really nicely plug focused ultrasound into surgery, chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So this is by no means an area that we are, are working on specifically, but we're, we're very in touch with that space. And, and what you're referring to is radio sensitization using focused ultrasound. So basically leveraging either the heating or or mechanical cavitation effects of focused ultrasound in order to basically prime the breast cancer microenvironment for better receipt of radiation therapy. And there's some great research coming out of Sunnybrook um, Health Sciences Center up in Toronto, led by Greg Jornada. In fact, um, I just saw uh, a recent abstract on their phase one trial for radio sensitization in breast cancer. And the bottom line is that they're exploring some really creative ways of leveraging focused ultrasound as an adjunct in order order to, as you mentioned, uh, reduce, reduce the effective dose of radiation that would be necessary um, to uh, deploy in patients. And, and, you know, I think one of the major themes that we're touching on with everything we're talking about here is reducing toxicities, reducing discomfort, and, and enhancing safety that's associated with these um, uh, clinical mainstays in breast cancer. And so I really think that that is one of the themes that I feel inspired by on a daily basis, because that to me translates to immediate impact for patients, um, even in the absence of the more far reaching things we're thinking about with immunomodulation and, and potentiating immunotherapies. So yeah, radio sensitization is certainly one of those emerging areas that um, we did not have time to talk about in this webinar, but there are a lot of great resources on. Right. And one last thing I do want to mention, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, you have both Dr. Shabani and I on here, and it's important to think about that bench to bedside. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, we kind of peripherally mentioned it, but Breast 54 is a direct offshoot of Dr. Shabani's work uh, at, in the bench, and it is bench to bedside. And, and it's not unlikely that uh, as we move into this trial of breast 54 that the information that we gain for treating patients will go back to the the bench side uh, so that we can uh, you know further refine these treatments and really come up with the the best treat most effective uh, treatments with minimal toxicity and uh, highest efficacy uh, and at UVA we're really lucky to have uh, this broad uh, palette of of uh, talented people to work with that, uh, you know, we have this true bench to bedside connection and true expertise in immune therapy as well, as well as trial design uh, and, you know, a, a high volume breast practice and patients who are very uh, willing and eager to, to, to participate in trials and, and help improve treatments. Well, we are all very lucky that you guys are working so closely together. And uh, that comes to our time. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Thank you both, Dr. Chabani and Dr. Brennan, for dedicating your time and expertise to help us learn about the current state of the field of breast cancer. And of course, thank you, Christina, for sharing your journey and for your commitment to research. Behind the scenes, I'm indebted to a dedicated team at the Fuss Foundation who make this happen seamlessly, especially my IT department, as well as Joe Rice and the entire communications team. If your question was not answered, or if you want more information, please visit our website at fussfoundation.org or email us at info at fussfoundation.org. Uh, stay tuned to our newsletter and our website for invitation to future webinars and online events. Again, this webinar will be available on the Foundation website and on our YouTube channel over the next 24 hours. So share it with your colleagues, friends, patients, and families. Uh, we need your help to increase this awareness. We need Dr. Shabani and Dr. Brennan to continue their research to help patients like Christina, myself, and the millions of others who continue to live with breast cancer. So thank you all for joining and I hope everyone has a fantastic day. Mm -hmm.